Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Karat Writer and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 1985 movie Legend. Now Legend was directed by William by Ridley Scott and it was written by William Hartsburg. It is a fantasy adventure romance that in the American version it was uh, about an hour and 30 minutes duration and the director's cut edition which was released on DVD in 2002 ran for an hour and 55 minutes long and in the American version the soundtrack was done by Tangerine Dream whereas in the director's cut edition it was done by uh, the late great Jerry Goldsmith. The stars of the movie were Tom Cruise, Mia Sara, Tim Curry, David Bennett, Cork Hubbard, Billy Barty, Alice Pl Playton, and Annabelle Linian. Now the story goes something like this. In the fairy tale atmosphere where elves, sprites, and unicorns live together in peace and harmony, the woodland creatures are oblivious to the fact that evil is lurking on the horizon. The evil Lord of Darkness, played by Tim Curry, feeling lonely and isolated, recruits his goblins and minions to destroy the last surviving unicorns and to shed dark on this vibrant, lightly colored uh, fairy tale universe and their job is to destroy the last surviving unicorns in order to regain their power. Princess Lily meanwhile is in the forest and is being tutored by a young elf named Jack played by Tom Cruise the languages of the animals. He shows her the unicorns who protect all that is good when all of a sudden one of the unicorns gets shot with a poisoned blow pipe dart and Lily who eventually blows off Jack's warning about going near the unicorns throws her ring as a distraction into the lake. Jack tries to retrieve it but the beautiful lake has turned to solid ice. When Jack successfully resurfaces Lily is now gone and was kidnapped by the goblins along with the last surviving unicorn. Feeling that Jack cannot fight this battle on his own, he eventually ends up befriending a boyish elf named Honeythorn Gump, played by David Bennett, a fairy named Una, played by Annabelle Lanyon, and two dwarfs named Brown Tom and Screwball, played by Cork Hubbard and Billy Barty. They eventually join forces to save their land and to rescue Lily before it is too late. Meanwhile in the Lord of Darkness's lair he starts uh, tempting Lily with uh, superficial gifts and sweet nothings but she wants no part of his evil schemes but eventually, ev but eventually becomes mesmerized feeling that she has no hope for herself she eventually gets manipulated into his evil schemes and is eventually transformed from a sweet lovable sprite to a more wicked person and up to the point where she eventually um, is left with no choice but to take the Lord of Darkness's hand in marriage but only if she is allowed to destroy the last unicorn Feeling smitten upon this request, the Lord of Darkness gladly takes in to her request, but, but, but he doesn't know that she is tricking him. Eventually, um, Tom, I mean Jack and his gang finds Lord of Darkness's whereabouts and uses uh, a Heliothorpe to shed some light which is the Lord of Darkness's main weakness. But uh, he is not going to be destroyed because darkness is what balances between 
good and evil. So eventually he ends up, uh, gets blasted away to space, not knowing where his whereabouts afterwards. Eventually the fairy tale land has been restored, everything is back the way it is. Jack eventually retrieves the ring and places it on Lily's fingers and they all live happily ever after but in the but in the uh the director's cut edition we hear the lord of darkness laughing feeling that you know although he may have lost a battle but he's still not completely destroyed what did i think about the movie well this was directed during a time when fairy tale type stories were coming to the screen at the time. You know, such films like Labyrinth, Never Ending Story, The Dark Crystal and such. It was during a, that, that period of time where directors felt like they could be just as adept as writing fairy tale stories as the predecessors from before them. Guys like Aesop, uh, Hans Christian Andersen, the Brothers Grimm, and so forth. And, you know, this was during the time when directors had this sense of letting their imaginations take them to beyond one's imagination. And, uh, let's see here. Uh,. What stood out from uh, Legend was that it did not fare very well at the box office as many fans were turned off by its choppiness, its awkward settings, and its somewhat lopsided predicaments. There was not a lot of action in the movie and maybe some people even complained that it was too short. But fortunately they had a restored edition and I actually have to say that it had improved a lot more substantially. If you should get the restored edition, the director's cut edition, I would recommend you to see that one over the American cut edition which seems very awkward and choppy. Okay. But, you know, if you look through both sides of the movie, it is very, very deep, very, very provocative. And I know i got to give a hands off, to, a hats off to um, Ridley Scott for creating such an exhilarating atmosphere. And it also leaves a moral message about just leaving things the way they are, even through hardness and temptation. And I think Lily actually kind of had to learn that pivotal lesson. Uh, what did I think of the performances? Well, a very young Tom Cruise as Jack was painfully underdeveloped. Sure, he looked the part, and he kind and his costume and his physicalness, his physical character, kind of reminds me a bit like the Legend of Zelda character Link. You know, with the long hair, the elf-like costume, and, uh, you know, his aim carrying a sword, defeating all kinds of bad guys and stuff like that. And I think maybe this movie was the inspiration for the video game legacy of The Legend of Zelda. And he really captures that. But the thing is, is the reason why his role was underdeveloped is because there is no origin story from him. There's no indication about his parents, his whereabouts, how he became the way he is, uh, who are his guardians, if there was any. I mean, we are kind of like left in limbo for him. And he really doesn't stand out as the definitive protagonist. The real scene stealers in the movie truly come from Mia Sara as Princess Lily. Her transformation from a sweet, spontaneous, playful princess to a more gothic, dark dressed, laden, wicked person really, really took off. Uh, she, her transformation is what really sells a lot in this movie and it's very engaging and we kind of like want to root for her to go back to the way she is 
And no, in e in whether she looks like the sweet princess or the gothic demoness, she is beautiful throughout. But the real scene stealer in the movie definitely is no doubt about it, Tim Curry as the Lord of Darkness. I mean, he just chomps up ev the, whole, ev the whole cast. Curry has the right amount of malice to set the tone for a hostile takeover. His physical presence is scary. And when I first watched this movie back in 1985 when I was nine, he really gave me nightmares for a week. His long horns, his evil grimace, the makeup, the prosthetics. It made me feel f fearful for the color red. It really did, you know. He gave me nightmares for a whole fucking week. But underneath the prosthetics and the makeup and the over-the-top physicalness, we also see that he's also not this typical dumb villain. He's quite intelligent and philosophical. And he knows that the only thing that lightness can do is uh, soften his pace, but he can't be fully destroyed by light because it only shows, it only just slows him down, and that his darkness is what balances good and evil. And that it's kind of like, I guess, unnatural that, ev that everything is always good. And that, you know, in order for Jack and Lily and the rest of the gang to defeat the Lord of Darkness, you kind of sometimes have to pull off a few dirty tricks in order to conquer evil. All good guy characters sort of have to somewhat break some rules if they want to restore what was taken from you. And I think that's kind of also the pivotal lesson here in this story. That not everything is always as good as it seems. There's always a little bit of yin-yang in everyone and everything. Even the Lord of Darkness has some positive sympathy towards him. Because, you know, we feel that he is lonely. And we do sometimes sympathize with bad people and he seems to be more the more de most developed character in the story the cinematography in the movie is what really sells thanks to the vibrant colors and glamour even the Lord of Darkness's chambers dark tones is kind of what we would expect in the Lord of Darkness's chamber and his bad guy villains and villainesses were also quite convincing and Dark and Day 2 were also quite scary looking. As a precaution, I probably will not let the younger audience uh, see this movie. The tone is actually quite disturbing and the creatures are very scary, especially the Lord of Darkness. I mean, he scared me when I was nine years old. I'm sure it would have scared the younger audiences too, so I would kind of recommend that if you want to watch, let your children watch this movie, be advised and tell them that, uh, you know, it's just a fairy tale, it's fictitious, and, you know, s sit by them and tell them, you know, it's just a movie, but I think, uh, you know, they'll catch on. But it's just that some of the creatures in this movie are very intimidating. And the Lord of Darkness is probably one of the scariest characters you probably ever imagined. I mean, I thought that the Lord of Darkness was even more scary than another one of Tim Curry's evil doings. It the Clown from Stephen King's It. So I guess this kind of ends my um, my presentation for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. And please write back to me. Remember, be kind, polite, and courteous. And I hope uh, you all take care of yourselves and each other. Goodbye.